Um, I need. I have a confession this morning, which is that I have never liked this healing story, ever. And the reason I don't like it is because Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, and she gets up and serves them. And I want to say... That sounds great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to say, could we let the woman rest? She's just been sick. Especially in my early days of feminism. Urgh, patriarchy. Even in the Bible, right? Um, grown a little, matured a little since then. It still, it still bugs me. Um, and then, you know, I remember my grandmother, Ebke, my German grandmother, who, she loved to feed people. She fed all of their farmhands every day. She started every day making four loaves of bread and two pies to make all of the folks that she had to feel every day. And for her, it was not a chore, it was a joy. And I know my grandmother, Ebke, if she were healed, she would immediately get up and make Jesus dinner, right? And I think of myself, I too show my thanks to people by cooking for them. And I know that there are many of you that I've said, hey, come to this potluck. And you've said, oh, I don't think I can come because I can't bring food. And I say, wait, just come. All of us, I think, like to serve, like to be part of the useful piece. And so I think maybe it's not so much that Jesus healed her so she would serve him. (laughs) That makes me annoyed. (laughs) Instead, Jesus healed her so that she could be her authentic self, which included showing her gratitude by serving him. And I wonder, she was a good Jewish woman, if as she was kicking around the kitchen, she was thinking, those who wait upon their Lord will renew their strength, because that's just happened to her. We don't know if that was on her mind after her healing, but she certainly knew the story behind Isaiah 40. The time is around 550 B.C., And God's people are in exile in Babylon. They're the second generation of people in diaspora in faraway Babylon. And they are forgetting who they are and whose they are. They're forgetting their stories, the stories that make them a people. They're thinking that God is forgetting too. That God is Silent, and now they are lost forever, and there's no future for them or their children. And it is to them that the prophet Isaiah offers a word from God. And God's word is assurance, and God's word is power and faith. And God's word is healing and hope. And God's word is love and promise. Have you not known? Isaiah cries. Have you not heard? Simon's mother-in-law knew and heard. And I wonder if that day she thought those words weren't just for those far long ago people of my faith. Those words are for me too. And I wonder if she saw Jesus and said, he is those words. Was she the first one to get that he was the incarnation of the word, I wonder? And she responds, let's have a party. I'll bring the snacks. And heads to the kitchen. I love snacks. So guess what? The ancient story of Isaiah is our story too. Even in 2024, God is still entering into our own experiences of brokenness and exile, asking us to grab onto a new possibility for living, to grab onto the God who yearns to make us new. God would raise us up on eagle's wings if we would grab onto God's hand. That there's a catch. We can grab onto God, but to fly like eagle's wings, we have to let go of the ground. (laughs) 
We found out uh, while we were uh, camping one year in Maine that even eagles have to let go of the ground to fly. Uh, we were uh, kayaking in Maine, and I saw, we were watching this amazing bald eagle flying around, and it spied a fish, and it gracefully thumped down into the water, and there was this epic struggle, and then up comes the eagle, and it's flapping as hard as it can, and it got into the air about a foot, and we could see this big honking fish that it had its talons in, and it kept flapping, and it was not going anywhere, and it went down under the water, and it came back up, and down under the water, and finally the eagle came back up out of the water without the fish, and it still couldn't fly because its wings were now wet and could not form a good airfoil, and so it, and looking at me going, I know you saw that, you, he, he kind of swam, flopped his way on the surface of the water to the shore where he could shake off and dry off for a while and recover from his humiliation, um, regain his dignity a bit. But we realize that even eagles can't rise up on eagles' wings if they can't let go of a burden that is too heavy. Which sounds obvious, but it's not that obvious in real life. It's... There is so much that catches us at one time or another. My earlier annoyance at this healing story is a good example of what did I need to let go of so that I could actually fly with the message of good news that is there. That doesn't mean that all of my instincts for egalitarian living are wrong, but I get caught in assuming I know what someone else's life should look like. It's a lot easier for me to soar on eagle wings if I'm paying attention to what my life should look like instead of being sure about others. This is the first week of Black History Month, a time when we remember the astounding witness of so many black folk in this country who have risen up on eagles' wings when everything in this nation's structure was arrayed against them. John Lewis famously rephrased a Martin Luther King quote saying, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Love is the better way. His example and the example of countless other prophets of love showed that to rise up on eagles' wings, prophets need to let go of the ground of hate, even in the face of violence and grief and injustice. Isaiah said, wait upon the Lord renewed, renewing your strength of love. This week I read a piece <clears throat> by Liat Adzili with the provocative title, Choosing Rebirth Over Revenge After My Release from Gaza. Ms. Adzili is an educator at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Center in Jerusalem, and she was one of the 240 hostages taken during the attack on October 7th. She's an American and Israeli citizen, and she was released after 54 days and discovered to her amazed delight that all three of her children had miraculously survived. She also learned that her husband had been killed in the attack and their home burned to the ground. And as she rebuilds her life, Ms. Adzili reflects on her work at Yad Vashem. And when she educates high school students who come to that memorial, she tells them that the, for the first generation that survived the Holocaust, they pair the word Shohah in Hebrew, which means Holocaust, with the word, the word Tekumah, which means rebirth. 
and talks about how Tekuma provides them, has provided them the lesson to look toward healing and renewal with dignity and purpose rather than sinking into revenge and grief. She says, without Tekuma, my country will only sink further into the cycles of mutual anger and victimhood that has plagued our relationship with Palestinians for too long. I want to focus on building a better future for my children and for the children of Gaza. Surely, she says, if the decimated European Jewish population was able to face the future with optimism after the Holocaust, we too can find strength to repair what is broken. We too can choose Tekuma. In choosing Tekuma, in choosing rebirth, Ms. Atsili claims the ancient words of Isaiah. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. She claims the ancient words from Israel's past as her story in the present. And she wants it to be her children's story and the story of all the children of Gaza as well. Her words of hope and peace are in the stories echoed by Palestinian Christians and Muslims crying out for peace with justice as well. We heard them echoed a few weeks ago by Harvard Hillel Rabbi Getzel and Harvard Imam Khalil at a chaplain symposium where they choose life and peace over the dominant cries for vengeance and war. Tekuma is rising on eagle's wings by being willing to let go of the siren call of vengeance. Not by forgetting the pain, but by remembering, and then because of the pain, making the deliberate choice toward rebirth, toward peace, toward shalom. One step at a time. One hard step at a time. One holy step at a time. It doesn't always feel like flying. But Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. And so how do we have the grace and the faith and the perspective to be able to enact those words from MLK, to live into the vision that Ms. Adzili offers us? Isaiah tells us, Wait upon the Lord. Pray, study, talk together with other people. Be in beloved community so that you can live into love and beloved community. Somehow, when we wait upon the Lord, our strength is renewed. Somehow, we are able to find flight that was not possible before for us. May we be part of those eagle's wings in our own settings and in the world. May we be part of Tekuma. Amen.